Voices of America. Hello and welcome. Welcome to African News Tonight from the English to Africa service of the Voice of America, your source for Pan African news and world developments. Ab Yehia Suhib in Washington. Coming up on African News Tonight. The result of over prescribing of antibiotics is microbial resistance. The microorganisms will grow more resistant against the antibiotics. That's Dr. Norman Matara, Secretary General of the Zimbabwe Association of Doctors for Human Rights on antibiotics losing their effectiveness due to overuse. Details coming up. Also, Ghana's president warns of the spreading Islamist insurgency in West Africa. Mali orders all non-governmental organizations financed by France to stop activity in the country. And Tunisia draws 0-0 against Denmark in the World Cup opener. We have these stories and more on African News Tonight. We start with our top story. Ghana's president warned West African leaders today of the spreading Islamist insurgency in the region. According to Reuters, President Nana Akufo Addo told the meeting in Accra of neighboring leaders and European Union ministers that terrorist groups are seeking new grounds and that the worsening situation threatens to engulf the entire region. Another participant at the meeting, European Council President Charles Michel, urged the EU to provide lethal hardware for defensive purposes that would have an impact on the ground. Much of the fight against groups linked to the Islamic State and Al-Qaeda is taking place in Mali. France, Denmark and Ivory Coast have withdrawn their troops from the country in protest against Bamako's support for Russia's use of the mercenary Wagner group there. They're also protesting alleged abuses by the army and the military government's failure to hold promised elections leading to civilian rule. The UN says the decade-long fight against the insurgents has killed thousands of people and displaced nearly three million. Mali's military government has ordered all non-governmental organizations, including aid groups financed by France, to stop activity in the country. Annie Reisenberg reports from Bamako, Mali. The government's official statement was read on state TV station ORTM Monday evening by presenter Ibrahim Traoré and later posted on the station's Facebook page. The statement says the decision was made after France's announcement of its suspension of development aid to Mali, which came last week and which France says is due to concerns about Mali working with Russian mercenaries from the Wagner Group. France specified that it would maintain humanitarian aid despite suspending development aid. En conséquence, le gouvernement de la transition décide Consequently, Traoré says, the transitional government has decided to prohibit, with immediate effect, all activities carried out by NGOs operating in Mali with funding or with material or technical support from France, including in the humanitarian field. The statement also claimed that France's suspension of aid is intended to deceive and manipulate public opinion for the purpose of destabilizing and isolating Mali. The statement goes on to refer to France's aid to Mali as dehumanizing aid used as a means of blackmailing rulers and actively supporting terrorist groups operating on Malian soil. The statement does not clarify or offer proof of the accusations. Diplomatic relations between France and Mali have been increasingly tense this year since France supported sanctions by the West African country grouping ECOWAS against Mali over delayed elections. The French ambassador was expelled in January, and French President Emmanuel Macron announced the withdrawal of French troops after almost 10 years in February. France has continually accused Mali of working with Russian mercenaries, which the Malian government has denied, claiming to only work with Russian instructors. Several cases of alleged human rights abuses by mercenaries working with the Malian army have been documented by human rights groups and journalists this year. France supports a large number of NGOs working in the humanitarian sector in Mali, which provide services to vulnerable populations in the country. Annie Reisenberg for VOA News, Bamako, Mali. Early this month, Ethiopia's national government and the Tigray People's Liberation Front agreed to end their nearly two-year-old war. Thousands of soldiers and civilians have died, and millions in the Tigray region face a humanitarian crisis, including severe hunger. 
A few days ago, VOA's Carol Castiel spoke with two leading U.S. experts in the region for an assessment of the agreement. Ambassador Tibor Naj is the former Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs and former U.S. Ambassador to Ethiopia and Guinea. And Ambassador Donald Booth also is a former U.S. Ambassador to Ethiopia, as well as the former Special Envoy to Sudan and South Sudan. In this excerpt of their conversation, the ambassadors talk about how the agreement will be implemented. Ambassador Naj, let's take a look now at this November 12th implementation agreement that you both referred to. Many steps, a hotline, the need for demobilization of forces. Where are we in that regard? Do we have a timetable with regard to the disarmament of the uh, TPLF, demobilization, withdrawal of other forces? Can you tell us more about that? There are certain timelines put into the agreement, but I don't think that they're going to be ironclad because a lot of this depends on being able to communicate to the various forces that are on the ground. And as Ambassador Booth mentioned, for complete demobilization of the Tigrayans, I think that will depend on what happens with the Eritrean forces, because Ethiopian forces are supposed to be able to go in and monitor the border. Also, the AU is supposed to be able to send monitors for the border to guarantee that there's no foreign forces left. So I think a lot of that will definitely stretch on. The important thing, from my point of view, in these kinds of very, very heated situations, it's really critically important to start with what we would call low-hanging fruit and kind of move up the tree to the more complicated and more difficult issues. So the immediate needs, as Ambassador Booth mentioned out, is the total access for humanitarian relief, for medicines, for the restoration of electricity, internet service, bit by bit. No one should expect any quick solutions on this, especially when you come to issues like the final status of what is called both Welkai by the Amhara or Western Tigray by the Tigrayans, which to me is going to be the most difficult issue that's going to be sticking out there. Indeed. So, Ambassador Booth, what is the status of, in your view, you know, humanitarian assistance delivery and the protection of civilians, given the lack of trust between the people of Tigray and, of course, the Ethiopian military. Are there going to be monitors for that aspect of this deal? And what is the role of AU? Will they continue to play a role in implementation? Absolutely. In fact, the African Union has said that it will establish a monitoring and verification unit and that military leaders from South Africa, Kenya, and Nigeria mirroring the leadership of the mediation effort, have been meeting to, I think, plan this out. I hope that that unit can be deployed quickly. It may require some assistance from some of the uh, outside international partners. If that's needed, I hope that that will be forthcoming quickly. Uh, You need to have monitors on the ground, people who will call a spade a spade. There will inevitably be different interpretations of events that will happen, particularly regarding protection of civilians. I'm sure there will be glitches in humanitarian aid delivery. But I must say, I was very pleased to hear from the head of the World Food Program, David Beasley, on the 17th of this month, that indeed a large convoy had been able to enter into Tigray and necessary permits were being issued by Ethiopian authorities. So this is a very positive development. The demobilization effort, according to the agreement, was supposed to start on November 15th. I don't know whether that has actually begun in practice or not. I think it's probably still in the planning stage. But I understand that there is a planned meeting in Tigray, I think, believe in McKelly, for some time in the month of December, where the two sides will come together to discuss directly implementation of the ceasefire, the cessation of hostilities, and it's to be followed by a meeting in Addis in January. So there are a number of benchmarks that we will need to watch closely, but they're off to a good start. And so I would hope we could hang on that positive note while keeping in the back of our minds that there are many difficult things still to be resolved. As I mentioned, protection of civilians by the Ethiopian National Defense Forces is going to be very tricky given the climate of distrust. The question of accountability is something that is going to, I'm sure, be contentious as atrocities have been committed. And 
I think the leadership is going to look very carefully about how they want to address that question. But it's something that I believe the people will need to see some accountability for why so many millions of people have suffered and so many tens of thousands have been killed in this conflict. That was Carol Castiel, host of VOA's Encounter program. She was speaking with Ambassador Tibor Naj and Donald Booth about the agreement to end fighting in Ethiopia's Tigray region. To hear their full discussion, the Encounter podcast is available for free download on our website at voaafrica.com slash encounter. And look for all your favorite programs at voaafrica.com. <music> This week, the international community is marking Anti-Microbial Awareness Week, which runs from November 18th to November 24th. According to the World Health Organization, Antimicrobial Resistance, AMR, occurs when bacteria, viruses, fungi, and parasites change over time and no longer respond to medicines, making infections harder to treat and increasing the risk of disease spread, severe illness, and death. This comes in view of a looming global risk of overprescribing life-saving antibiotics following COVID-19. From Harare, reporter Kuzai Zanawashi looks at the level of risk in Zimbabwe. Geoffrey Kwakua is a pharmacist in Harare. The result of overprescribing of antibiotics is microbial resistance. The microorganisms will grow more resistant against the antibiotics. You'd find most infections, they are self-limiting, but most patients will get an antibiotic to treat their condition. It's a growing problem across the world. Kuakua gives an outlook of the situation in Zimbabwe. In Zimbabwe, there is overprescribing of antibiotics. The doctors usually do what they call empirical prescribing, which means they prescribe from the top of their heads without sending the patient for culture and sensitivity tests to determine the nature of the causative microorganism. Dr. Nomen Matara is the Secretary General of Zimbabwe Association of Doctors for Human Rights. He says Zimbabwe's challenges go beyond overprescribing. We are now witnessing antibiotics actually being sold on the streets, even by non medical people. I think two weeks ago, I was seeing a, a, a WhatsApp advert, someone actually selling medications, including antibiotics, on WhatsApp, and that person is a non medical person actually being sold in the streets in Harare. And uh, people are buying antibiotics even uh, from Zambia, and they are bringing them into the, into the country. Uh, even before we talk about uh, medical practitioners, some who may be over prescribing antibiotics, there's that danger of uh, having antibiotics uh, on the street. Matara calls for more public awareness of antibiotics. He says often patients present themselves to hospitals after they have self-prescribed the medicines. Laboratories are often out of reach to many consumers because of the prices they charge for one to ascertain if they are really in need of antibiotics. Similar with consulting a doctor, which attracts a fee, Kuakua says governments and stakeholders need to increase access to laboratories as a way of limiting the excessive use of antibiotics without due process. Health specialists often issue statements to the public against harmful medicines that are often smuggled into the country's streets from beyond Zimbabwe's borders. For VOA, this is Kudzai Namashe from Harare. You're listening to Africa News Tonight on The Voice of America. The World Health Organization estimates COVID-19 has claimed the lives of over 6.5 million people with at least 634 million confirmed cases worldwide. However, public health experts say there's hope on the horizon with the WHO recently reporting a 90% drop in global COVID deaths since February. The Director General of the WHO, Tedros Ghebreyesus, called that a cause of for optimism. 
The drop in the number of deaths is attributed to a number of factors, but most importantly, it has to do with the number of people who have received COVID vaccines. Even though vaccine coverage in many African countries falls far behind the global target, some including Zambia, which started its COVID-19 vaccine rollout in April 2021, have been able to achieve that goal. The Zambian government recently announced it had reached the milestone of fully vaccinating 70% of its population. So how did Zambia do it in the face of vaccine shortages and disinformation about the vaccine? VOA's Jackson Mfungane spoke with Dr. Muka Chikuba in Lusaka. She's the country representative for the public health organization, JSI, and chief of party for the USA Discover Health Program. In this excerpt of their conversation, Dr. Chikuba first talks about how COVID-19 affected the country. You know, the impact of COVID, especially during the early waves, was really, really significant. Uh, We had so many uh, uh, people who were infected at the beginning of the COVID pandemic. Uh, We had lockdowns. Our health system was failing to cope. Uh, We are a country with... um, Uh, a health workforce that was at 46% during the early waves of uh, 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 COVID-19, the COVID-19 pandemic. And the health system was failing to cope because it was already overstretched by the time the uh, COVID-19 pandemic hit. So we had so many health workers who were sick. And then because the health system was was overstretched with so few health workers. Uh, the, the system was failing to cope with a number of clients and patients who were very critically ill with COVID-19. So not only were, was the health system failing to cope, uh, uh, people's livelihoods were affected. They were not able to go out to work and earn a living. We are a developing country with a lot of people living on the margin. And it was really, really difficult, both on the health system, on the household level, and on the economy. It was a really, really bad impact uh, during the first waves. But like many other countries, once the vaccination program started and we started vaccinating our people, we began to see some relief Mm. from some of the severe, severe impact at the beginning of the pandemic. Now, Zambia's Ministry of Health recently achieved its goal of uh, getting to up to 70% of the nation's eligible population fully vaccinated against COVID-19. How was it able to achieve this milestone? So one year ago, in October 2021, when the president of Zambia, two months after he was elected into office, announced the target of fully vaccinating 70% of the eligible population, the coverage, fully vaccinated coverage, stood at 3.5%. To many of us, this target seemed unattainable. This was especially so given the very low vaccination uptake that was largely driven by highly prevalent myths and misconceptions about the safety and efficacy of COVID-19 vaccinations. So how did Zambia accomplish the turnaround? It took accepting with humility that we as health experts did not have all the answers in this this case and reaching out with respect to our communities and the Zambian people to obtain their input, acceptance and buy-in and their participation in the vaccination effort. Firstly, we went to the Zambian people and got their input to design tailored COVID-19 messages that resonated with them to help change mindsets and behavior about COVID-19 vaccination. The key message that came out for us in Zambia was get vaccinated, protect Zambia, really speaking to the patriotism that we were trying to, 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 to energize to get people vaccinated, but that message came from them. And that became our campaign slogan. We then went all out to share timely and accurate information with the people, including on -on one-on-one basis, 
to encourage them to get vaccinated for themselves and for their families. But we did so respecting personal choices. Some people just didn't want to be vaccinated and we respected some of those personal choices. That was Muka Chikuba, the Zambia representative for the public health organization, JSI. She spoke by phone with my colleague, Jackson Mfungadye. On day three of the World Cup, Tunisia's Eagles of Carthage have tied 0-0 with Denmark. VOA's Kali Abdu and Sunday Shomari are in Qatar for all the action. Before the match kicked off, they spoke with Tunisian fans. This man's hopes were very high. My name is Jalel. I'm from Tunisia. I came all the way here for the World Cup, and we're facing Denmark which was semi-finalists of the last Euro Cup, so they're not easy to beat. It's going to be tough, but we have over, I think, I think we have easily 35,000 people here from our country, and that's going to make a difference tomorrow on the stadium, hopefully. Thank you so much, guys. This woman was a bit less optimistic about the team's chances in the tournament. It's going to be, uh, it's going to be one of the... Unfortunately, I think we're gonna lose from the second, uh, the second, second time. Yeah, but at least we will play one time and we will uh, win for one time. Which game do you believe we're gonna win? We will win with Denmark, not with France. Australia also no. So maybe with Denmark. Denmark. This woman is from Tunisia but lives in Qatar. She tells our Sunday Shamari she thinks the large number of Tunisian fans will encourage the team. It's going to be uh, it's going to be one of the unfortunately I think we're going to lose from the second uh, the second, second time. Yeah, but at least we will play one time and we will uh, win for one time. Which game do you believe we're going to win? Uh, there was disappointment yesterday in Senegal when, when the Taranga Lions fell to the Netherlands to kneel. In Dakar, reporter Alfa Jallo spoke with fans to hear their reaction. Teacher Babu Kar Ndaye said the loss of star Sadio Mani, who was knocked off the team because of an injury, was part of the Lions' problem. Um, definitely the boys have um, gave their best. Um, it's in football, and we know as far as football is concerned, there must be a winner and a loser. But notwithstanding, I believe um, more could have been done to um, counter the efforts of the Netherlands and in, in trying to station and play very well. One thing I realize is the absence of our key player, Sadio Mane, has definitely shown some impact. I, I believe the boys should just leave with the reality that... Um, our star player is not on the ground and will not join us in this World Cup. Uh, when they put up their minds and heart together, I believe we can move on as a team and then try to do what, what is expected of us. Hard luck to the boys and uh, wish them uh, a better luck. I believe we are still in this. We will come back stronger and well prepared for the game. Back to the drawing board, inshallah. Mustafa Diouf is an English teacher and translator. He was disappointed about the reaction of the team's loss and says the Lions' triumph in the Africa Cup of Nations tournament early this year offers him hope. I think that the Senegalese team played very well in the first half. It is only in the last 15 minutes of the match that uh, the Hollandese team took possession of the ball and took advantage of the situation to score. Anyway, I think that it is in situations like that that great players like Sardinia Mane could have helped the Senegalese team. But I think that we will uh, uh, win the next two matches, particularly the Friday match against Qatar. I think that we will uh, qualify for the second round of the tournament. In the first match today, Saudi Arabia upset Argentina 2-1. Mexico and Poland are battling it out on the pitch at this time, and later today, France takes on Australia. For all the latest on the World Cup, check out voaafrica.com slash World Cup. And stay tuned to all your favorite VOA programs, including the sunny side of sports. We'll have an update on today's action on African News tonight at 1800 UTC.